Not only did God create emotions, but when Jesus came down to earth, he experienced the emotions like you and I. We hear how Jesus cried when Lazarus was dead. We hear how Jesus was angry and turned tables in the temple when he saw injustice. Jesus had emotions. Sometimes we feel a bit uncomfortable thinking that Jesus had emotions because we think of emotions as good and bad. But emotions aren't good or bad. We can have positive or negative emotions, but it's actually how we respond to the emotions that makes something good or bad. The emotions are just a signal, a response to a situation that's going around us. But not only does God create us with emotions, not only did Jesus experience what it is to have emotions like you and I, but actually God sent his Holy Spirit, like we heard in the memory verse, in 2 Timothy 1.7. When God gave us his spirit, it wasn't one that said, oh, you're on your own with your emotions, learn how to handle them yourself. He goes, no, I've not made you fearful and weak, but I have given you power and love and self-control. You see, God has created us with something, but he's not gone, I'm leaving you abandoned. I'm gonna let you figure this out, children. I'm gonna let you figure this out, parents, and how to handle emotions. He's going, no, I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna empower you. I'm gonna show you and guide you along the way of how to handle your emotions. Our tagline over the last couple of days is keeping cool when things get hot. Why don't you turn to someone near to you and go, keep cool. Keep cool, people. Keep cool. I've got a box of some things that are gonna help me explain some things that we can do. When we're under the hot Hawaiian sun, it is so hot. Another thing that can feel very hot and fiery is a volcano. And our volcano is a little bit like some of our emotions. If we let them fester, if we let them build up, we erupt and explode like the volcano all over and lava spills everywhere. And lava destroys. Lava does not plant some beautiful flowers. It destroys everything it touches. I don't know about you, but I have seen my emotions explode a few times. And when they do, it destroys friendships. It destroys things that I've tried so hard to build and it's all broken in that moment because I've let myself explode like the volcano. But here, here, sorry, here, (laughs) here is a leaf like a palm tree under the hot sun. You can go under the palm tree to keep cool. Just like that, God can help us keep cool when things get hot. Sometimes with our emotion of anger, we need to just remove ourselves from the situation, remove ourselves from the hot blazing sun under the cool palm tree. Maybe there's other things and tools that you have how to help yourself with anger. Sometimes I've found counting before I speak. Just count to 20 and think, do I still need to say what I was going to say? Things really small, breathing when I'm feeling angry, so I'm not gonna physically want to punch somebody. (laughs) No, no, no one else feels like that ever. No, okay, just me occasionally. And I find breathing helps my mind get all the oxygen it needs to think clearly of what I need to do next. Keeping cool when things get hot. So as kids, we were learning to keep cool. And not only do we keep cool, but God can help us keep our cool. There was a guy in the Bible called Moses and he lost his temper and he ended up making some big mistakes. And when he exploded, it meant that not only did he hurt himself, but he hurt other people. We've got to learn how to handle our emotions because we don't just hurt ourselves we can hurt other people around us as well. So we gotta keep our cool when things get hot. Another thing that we learned about, if you recognize the green-eyed monster. When I was a child, if I ever looked at something, one of my friends had, mum goes, I can see the green-eyed monster coming out. And I'd go, no, because I was jealous. I wanted the toy that somebody else had. But jealousy isn't just for the little ones in the room. Even adults can compare themselves to other people next to them. And they can think, well, if I only had the marriage like they had, then I wouldn't have these problems. Well, if I only had that job security like they had, then I, and we create this jealousy in our life. And it creates this ugly moment monster. Jealousy can be a really ugly thing in our life and it can stop us from having good friendships and from valuing things that we have in our life as well. 
the way that God can help us with our jealousy, is actually understanding that Jesus is enough for us. There's a song called Christ is Enough that we sing here at church, but sometimes, I don't know about you, I feel like I'm singing it, but I'm like, oh but God, but help me really mean this. We have to help, allow God to help us with our jealousy. So when we feel that we're comparing ourselves, remembering that actually he's called us loved, he's called us his children, he's called us royalty, he has given us gifts, he has given us treasure. That is the God that we love and serve. He knows us and loves us so much. And I think if we stop and pause, even just for one moment, to think of the extravagant love, the crazy love that God has for us, we probably wouldn't be too jealous about what other people have. One of the names that God has is Jaira. And Jaira means provider. When we are secure and we know that our God is a good father and he gives good gifts to his children, we know that we don't need to want what other people have, but we can turn to God and go, God, I'm struggling with this right now and this is kind of what I'm wanting, but rather than projecting it and getting angry in my emotions and getting jealous with other people, I'm going to bring my emotions to you. Did you know that Jesus is a safe place to bring your emotions? He is the safest place because he's the one that created it. He's the one that has engineered your emotions. He's designed them. He knows how they work. And he's also experienced them himself. Bring your emotions to Jesus. There is a brothers in the Bible that were very jealous, Cain and Abel. And it's actually the first time we see anybody killed in the Bible. It's really, really sad. Because jealousy was brewing up so much in the older brother that he was so angry with his other brother, he let it erupt like a volcano. If you don't deal with your big emotions and try and handle them well, you think you're just brushing it under the carpet, but really it's not a carpet, it's a volcano. And you might not know when the last bit is going to explode on those around you, hurting yourself and hurting others around you. Will you today decide that God is enough for me? Another one we learned about is frustration. We can get so frustrated in life. And often our frustrations come because we don't like change. We don't like the changes that are around, done to us, happen around us. Maybe it's the frustration with the new school year that's coming. You're like, oh, it's not that teacher, is it? Oh, they're so mean. You know, you can get frustrated when um, you ask your children to keep tidy in their room and they don't do it. And that frustration builds up because you're, you're out of control of what's around you. There's a story in the Bible that Jesus teaches about a wise and foolish builder. And the foolish builder decides to basically build a sandcastle. It's like a big elaborative sandcastle because he decides to build his house upon sand. And if any of you have built a sandcastle before, know that that probably is not still standing today. Why? Because the waves come, the wind blows, and the rest of life continues but really, at the end of the day, it's because of the material it was made from and because of the foundation that it was put on. Our life is like a house that we are building. Each and every day, we get another brick to lay. And we get to choose, do we want to put it on some sand that then in the next day, it's washed away? And we get frustrated because we're trying to build something strong, something that will last, but our life just feels like it keeps falling apart. No matter how much we try, you get frustrated. But then Jesus talks about the wise builder. The wise builder doesn't decide to build his house on sand, but he decides to build it on a rock. Now many of our houses will build in upon a good foundation. And when Jesus is explaining this story, he's saying, I am the rock. My teachings are the rock. My word is the rock. Build your life upon me. Now, what's beautiful about God is even when we make mistakes and we try to build on the sand and it gets washed away, he forgives us. He doesn't go, oh, you blew it. No more chances for you. He goes, come on, darling. Let's try this again. Let's go again. Come and build your life upon my rock. I tell you now, if you learn to build your life upon Jesus, you will not be as frustrated in life when things change because it's not the fundamental thing that is changing. 
Think about when you're decorating the house. It can be a lot of work to repaint and remodel a house, but if there's a crack, if there's an issue in the foundation, that is danger. That is a danger zone. Some of us are building our life upon things that are good, but not strong enough to be the foundation of our life. We looked at some of the ideas that we can sometimes build our life upon. We can build a life upon family. Now, family are wonderful, and hopefully you have a wonderful, encouraging family. And if you do, maybe you've chosen to build your life upon the compliments and the friendship of that family, upon that community that they build around you. The challenge is family still changes. Family can still let you down. Family can still move. Family is not a reliable thing that you can build your life upon. Think about it like this. If I build my life upon my parents, which by the way, when I said to the kids, the horror on their faces, I think they thought I was physically building my life upon my parents. So the clarity is the idea of building my life on my family, yes? The, if I build my life on the compliments and their comfort that they speak over me, what happens when not, they're not here? I will be lost. I will have an identity crisis. Some of you adults in the room are struggling so much because you built your life on your family. Your parents were good parents to you. They loved you. They nurtured you. But the challenge is you've built yourself on a foundation that changes. And any foundation that changes is not strong enough to hold you. Or maybe you build it upon the successes and good grades and all the things that you can do in your life. Maybe you think it's because you can control it. You get that promotion. You get that title. The problem is all those things can still change. That job can be taken away from you. Someone's always going to be smarter than you. And that foundation is not strong enough for us to build our life upon. Or oh, what about friends? Okay, family we can't choose, but friends we can choose. I have chosen some good friends, some wise friends, but they can still change. Friends can still let you down. I can let down my friends. And the foundation can crack. And if we build our life upon these sorts of things, which are good things, would we say they are good things? But if we build our life upon them, then we'll get frustrated when things change rather than seeing it that we're building them on top of the foundation. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's the only one that we can truly rely on. His teachings are here for us to build our life upon each day. He's using this illustration to basically say to his followers, the people who are listening to him in the crowds, he's saying, don't just hear my words, but put them into practice. Maybe you've come to church and you have listened to the word over and over again in Sunday school and you go, yeah, I've heard about Jesus. Yeah, and I know that he lived, I know that he died, I know he rose again, but like, okay, how do I build my life on like a name of Jesus? You build your life on the name of Jesus by putting into practice the words that he has said, trusting in him, turning to him, letting him be the one that is your foundation. Is Jesus your foundation this morning? He will help you to handle your emotions and especially the frustration. The other one we looked at was sadness. There is a lot of sadness in our world and in our life. And it can be really difficult to go through different seasons and experiences when this sadness just feels all too much. One of the greatest saddest moments in all of history was when Jesus died on the cross. When the Son of God was persecuted, he was tortured, he was beaten, he was broken for you and I. He did absolutely nothing wrong. And yet, because of our mistakes, we put him on a cross. The horror of the idea of we crucified God the idea of the thing that he created and he loved has turned around and stabbed him in the back. The, 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 the one thing that he's kind of like, I'll come down and I'll help you and serve you. And, he's, and he was not taken for anyone. That is such a sad moment. Now we know three days later, Christ rose and he turns that sadness into joy. Jesus can do that for you and I as well. In our sadness, he can help us to find joy. See, joy is not just an emotion. 
joy is a fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are things you get from being in the presence of God. In some of my saddest moments of life, through the grief of my granddad, actually there was joy in those moments because God was so close. I got to see the joy of how church family came around and supported. I got to see the joy of knowing actually that my grandfather was no longer in pain and suffering, but he was with God. And yes, I'd miss him, but I knew that he was with heaven because he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. There was sadness and joy, and Jesus can turn our sadness into joy. Will you give your sadness to God? Because he can turn it around. The last bit of looking at how we can handle our emotions is actually, well then, how do we handle other people's emotions? Because no matter how good you are at your own emotions, and you might have great emotional intelligence, you have got so many tools in your back pocket, you know how to count to 20, you know how to walk away and diffuse from a situation, but do you know what? That child still keeps having that temper tantrum. You know what? That parent still keeps yelling at you. How do you handle other people's emotions? Because it's a big part of our life, it's a big part of relationships, it's a big part of our world. How do we handle other people's emotions? Well, we heard about the pineapple. The pineapple is a really prickly fruit. It can really, actually, sometimes if you grab onto it too hard, it could really hurt you. Some people are prickly people. They are a bit rude. They're a bit obnoxious. They're a bit, you know, they might call you names at school. They are just, just not nice people. They are like a prickly pineapple. But I wonder what could happen if we decide to keep showing kindness towards these people. I shared a story with the kids of how I, sh- how I sh- kept showing kindness to a friend at school. We were both as bad as each other, butting heads. Like, it wasn't like a one or the other. We were both going at, at, at each other. And my mom said to me, just show kindness. I did not want to show her kindness. I was like, she does not deserve my kindness. My mom reminded me that I don't deserve kindness either. The way that I've been acting, the way I've been name-calling, and the way that I have been reacting in my emotions. It's a hard truth pill to swallow. But you see, as Christians, we're not just being kind because it sounds good and it's a nice slogan to have. But actually, we're kind because the love that God has given us, we overflow that into our friendships. You see, we don't deserve God's love. We have not done anything to earn it, but because God loves us so much, it makes us see people in a different way. No longer do I see someone as a prickly pineapple, but actually go, there's a sweetness inside. If I can keep being kind, we can see that sweetness come out. I encourage you, even if someone is angry and frustrated at you, don't match it, don't scoop to their level, be kind. You'll be amazed at what kindness can do. It is not a weak asset. It is something that is powerful. It's something that is loud. It's something that is strong. If you've ever been in a moment where you've been on the receiving end of kindness, you know how powerful that can be. It can diffuse a situation, yes, but I tell you what, it can transform a life. This friend that I decided that I had to draw a line in the sand, give it to God and say, I'm going to be kind to. It was tough, it was painful because she was still a prickly pineapple. And any time I got close, I felt like I was getting pricked. Each time it was getting, like it was painful. But then after a while, she'd start coming to the events I would put on. She would maybe kind of sit next to me at lunch and we'd have pleasant conversations. And then there was this one day that she came with me to a youth event and she heard about God's love for herself. And because of that moment, she is now a Christian. She follows Jesus and so does her family and her children. Now that is not to say that I have been amazing in this story. It is to say that's the power of kindness. Perhaps because we're not willing to be kind, we're not opening opportunity for some people to receive God's love for that sweetness to truly come out. 
We've got to put our pride down as Christians. We've got to allow God to rule and not our emotions. We've got to allow him to keep us cool when things get hot. We've got to allow Jesus to be enough and not to get jealous. We've got to build our life on Jesus and not on faulty foundations. We've got to allow Jesus to turn our sadness into joy. Will you take your emotions to Jesus? He is a trustworthy one, not just for your sake. And parents, it is not just for your sake, it is for your children's sake too, because they will be picking up on how you handle your emotions. They will see and adopt those practices of how you erupt like a volcano, and they need to see a good, healthy practice of how you give it to Jesus, and how that kindness can turn a prickly situation into something so, so sweet. We can't change people. Jesus changes people. But he uses us to help other people experience God's love. We are his mouthpiece. We are his hands and feet. We are the light of the world. And wherever we go, we should be sharing the goodness of Jesus because we didn't deserve his love. So we give it freely. We forgive freely. We love extravagantly. We love audaciously. We, that is the way that we do it as Christians. In Matthew 11, 28, 29 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You might be feeling so weary because your emotions have been the driving force of your life. I want to encourage you, take it to the safe place of Jesus. He will refresh your soul. He will refresh your mind and he will help you know how to handle your emotions each and every day. Let us pray. God, we thank you for our emotions. We thank you that you have created us with so much detail. We pray that you will help us to understand what we are feeling and why we are feeling those emotions so that we can handle them in a good way. We pray that we will not explode like a volcano, destroying ourselves and everything around us, but that you will help us to keep cool when things get hot. We pray that you will help us in our jealousy and our comparison to not look at other people, not even looking in the mirror, but to look to you, God, knowing that you have given us more than enough. We pray, God, that in those times of frustration, when things keep changing around us, that you will help us to go back to basics and to build our life on you, Jesus, on your word and on your teachings. We pray when things in life are so tragic and so sad, that you will help us to find peace and joy in your presence. Remind us of how good it is to rest with you, God. And we pray that you will help us to be the light to other people to bring the sweetness out of those prickly pineapples around us. You will give us self-control, Holy Spirit. You will give us the power and the love to do your work. Because by ourselves, we are weak. We are fearful. But by your spirit, God, we have power, love, and self-control. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you come now. You fill us up so that we can do your good work. In Jesus' name, amen.